Thanks for the invitation to speak today. I'm going to talk about why airborne transmission of COVID was misunderstood and how it really works. Uh, here you have some links where you can find more information. And if I remove the, the captions, you can see the situation of close proximity and how airborne transmission works. And we'll, we'll go back to that. Okay, so let's think about airborne transmission versus droplets, which is the competitive theory. And this is the presentation from the Deputy Director of Infectious Diseases of the CDC for a workshop organized in the early COVID-19 pandemic to the National Academies of Sciences and Medicine. And what he said, which is the traditional view, is droplets, large droplets are projectiles. You can get infected, someone coughs, and then they have some of these droplets, visible droplets that land on your eye, for example. And gravity is making them fall to the ground and the gravity is what protects us. Now, airborne transmission is different. These are smaller aerosols that float in the air and here we're gonna be infected by inhalation. Okay? So is it the droplets or is it the aerosols? Well, early in the pandemic, we were told, for example, by WHO, unequivocally that it was the droplets. In this message, they told us fact, it is not airborne, and the droplets are too heavy to hang in the air and they may go into a surface, but it's not airborne. They were so certain that they told us to say that it is airborne is misinformation. Okay? So this was WHO's position and, and basically every public health authority's position at the start of the pandemic. Now, how, how has that hold up? Well, not so well. Science, you know, we have looked at the evidence and many others and the evidence is now overwhelming. This is a paper from over a year ago in the Lancet where we showed that there was a ton of evidence from many different lines of evidence that, that showed that COVID was an airborne virus. And what we conclude that is not just that it was a little bit airborne, is that airborne was likely to be the dominant way in which this virus was transmitted. And you know, this paper has is one of the most in, impactful ever for the Lancet. So this certainly has been, has been heard around the world. Although in this case, WHO, for example, took a little bit of time and this is an update from December of 2021, where they tell us finally that yes, there is short range, short range airborne transmission, which is when people get infected in close proximity, or there is also long range airborne transmission, which is when you share room air and you can get airborne transmission in both cases, finally acknowledging it. You know, this can be a little confusing, so let me show you a cartoon. And in this cartoon, we see both situations. This is the infected person, they are exhaling viruses and a few droplets. And you know, a person that's in close proximity is inhaling more of that air as you would inhale more of the smelly air if you were talking to someone who had eaten garlic, for example. And if you keep more distance, you smell less garlic, right? Now, someone who's sharing the room is breathing air that has been diluted a lot more, but it still can have the virus and they can still get infected. Okay, so those are the two situations. Now, as time goes, you know even though it's, it's politically inconvenient, the admissions keep coming. And for example, this is two years ago, sorry, sorry, two weeks ago, um, the leader of, of for COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic at the White House in the US said in a press conference that COVID is purely airborne. He, those are his words, which I take to mean is like, airborne is the only thing that's important for transmission. Of course, you, you could have the occasional transmission by other means, but really airborne is what matters, okay? So we have gone now, uh, we've covered the situation in which we were told that airborne was misinformation. And now the authorities are telling us that airborne is the only thing that matters. How could this be? Okay. So th there are a number of reasons, but I think one important reason is history. And we have written a paper in history about this history that I'm gonna explain, try to explain with this graph, okay? So in this graph, in the y-axis, we're representing how many diseases are thought to transmit um, through the air, okay? Most, the known, and we're gonna have the historical axis, the year on the x-axis, okay? So we start with Hippocrates, and Hippocrates said, when a lot of people get the same disease, it must be through the air because that's what we have most in common. And that evolved into miasma theory, which was dominant until 1850. There are a lot of details there we talk about in the paper, but really, the important thing is that even in 1850, when John Snow shows that cholera transmits through water, or when Ignaz Semmelweis shows that purpural fever transmits through hands, both men die before their discoveries are accepted because diseases are still thought to be transmitted by a miasma through the air. Okay. A little later in the 1880s, 
Albert King, uh, an American physician, says that, you know, I think malaria is transmitted through mosquitoes. But he encounters, again, the same skepticism. And it takes 20 years for unequivocal proof. Okay? But then we ended the 19th century, and this is the period also of germ theory. We really had a big paradigm shift on understanding disease transmission. And there is a debate. You know, is this miasma theory and transmission through the air? Is this just a superstition that, that, that we should abandon? Or, or no, there are still some diseases that go through the air. So there is a prominent American epidemiologist, Charles Chapin, that in 1910, he writes a book, he reviews the evidence, and he comes in favor of the first hypothesis. Uh, transmission through the air and miasmas are a superstition. And he says, it's, transmission through the air is very, very difficult. He says, it's really this spray of droplets. That's how you are getting diseases. And that's why when you, when you get farther away, you don't get infected because of this spray okay, of droplets. And he's too successful. And then basically uh, for a period of time until 1962, when tuberculosis is shown to transmit through the air, humanity believes that diseases don't go through the air for the most part. And uh, in 1930, William Wells tries to show that tuberculosis and measles transmit through the air, and he's accused of trying to bring back the miasmas. You know, the, the, view, the view that urban transmission is not important became very dominant. And for example, it's foundational for the CDC. Now, um, as, as you know, in 1962, William Wells and Richard Riley managed to show that tuberculosis is transmitted through the air. Until then, it was thought to transmit through droplets. In the 1980s, the same happens with for measles and chickenpox. They are thought to be droplet diseases, but now they are finally demonstrated to transmit through the air. But there is a general resistance. It's still believed that, okay, it's not impossible, but transmission through the air is very difficult. And we've gone through the same thing in an accelerated fashion for the COVID-19 pandemic. We have to, no, 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 it's not airborne. And finally, the evidence has shown completely otherwise, right? So now, is this only COVID or are there other respiratory diseases that may also be airborne? And what we, re we reviewed the evidence in this paper in science um, last year, and we reached the conclusion that basically it would be surprising if there were respiratory pathogens that were not airborne, okay? Airborne transmission should be our default hypothesis for any respiratory pathogen. And in particular for the flu, one of the very important ones with pandemic potential, there is actually more evidence than for COVID-19, and there is much more evidence than for tuberculosis or measles that the flu is actually airborne. It's just less contagious, but it's airborne. Um, you know, so RWHO and CDC catching on? Unfortunately, they are not. If you go to their web pages, they tell us it's the same thing of that tweet of WHO. These droplets fall to the ground or fall to surfaces and we have to wash our hands and it's basically droplets and surfaces. So, so we're not making uh, very quick progress. Now, so these large droplets, these projectiles, are they important, you know? So they have been wrongly attributed to, to Fluge, who was a researcher before shaping in the 1890s, but we actually published another paper where we looked at that evidence and that is wrong. Fluge never separated droplets and aerosols. He collected both together. He waited for the aerosols to settle on his collection plates before seeing if, the, if, if colonies of the microorganisms would be formed. Now, when you look at the literature, what was shocking to me certainly is that large droplets have never been demonstrated, not just for COVID, but for any disease in the history of medicine. There is no direct proof of any case of transmission through large droplets. And this is from a paper, the link is here, uh, from Hugo Lee, who's one of the members of the top committee of WHO. So this is not anybody. And there are other papers that make the same observation and nobody has been able to provide a paper that shows otherwise. Okay? And now if you look at all the evidence we have accumulated uh, during the pandemic, the physics-based studies show us that the droplets are much less likely. There are very few droplets. They have to hit you in the eye. They have only one chance. And they actually contain much less viruses than the aerosols because for all the pathogens where we have measured it, the pathogens are concentrated on the small aerosols. Okay. So at this point, I have reached the conclusion that if someone wants to argue that droplets are important for any disease, okay, we should listen to the evidence, but that now is an extraordinary claim and extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Okay. It's really a complete paradigm shift from where we were three years ago. So let's go back to try to think about this quantitative claim. Okay? So as part of the, the research that we have done that led to some of the conclusions I shown you, 
uh, we studied airborne transmission, okay, again, in, in close proximity and in, and in sharp rumor. When not just one person, but many persons are sharing rumor, that's when you get super spreading, okay? So we published a mathematical analysis of super spreading events, which is summarized in this graph. And each dot is a super spreading event. The y axis is the attack rate. So here 100% got infected, 60% got infected, and so on. And the x axis is an indicator of risk. What we demonstrated in this paper, which is a significant advance, I think, is that you can compress the things that make a situation risky, less ventilation, you spend more time, or people are coughing, or whatever, into a single number. Okay? And now the line is a, a airborne transmission model. It's not a fit to the data, it's a mathematical model. Each one of these dots is one of the famous cases that has enough data. So the famous choir, the airplane that arrived in Vietnam, the school in Israel, the call center in Korea, the restaurant in China, the buses in China, meatpacking in Germany. Studies of super spreading events of COVID all done by different groups. They all agree with an airborne transmission model. If transmission was through surfaces, they will have then we should see a scatter shot. There should be no relationship with the risk of airborne transmission. Okay? So this is showing us that airborne transmission explains super spreading and super spreading is very important for, for COVID. Okay? Now, I don't have time to dwell into the details, but this framework can be applied to tuberculosis and we applied it in the paper. If you look at the paper, tuberculosis is less, less transmissible. So you need a riskier situation to transmit. Now, missiles is on the other side. Missiles is more transmissible. So you need a less risky situation and you still get super spreading event for missiles. Okay. Again, I don't have time to, to go into this. It would be too, would take too much time. Okay. So now I just showed you a model of this situation, but what about this situation in close proximity when we have a lot of transmission, we have a lot of epidemiological observations that people say, well, because we have transmission in close proximity, this is evidence of droplets. This is the same error of, of Chapin in 1910. Is this the case or can we explain everything with airborne transmission? And I'm gonna do that and we did this in, in this other paper. And in this graph, we can see the dilution factor. It's not gravity, it's dilution that protects us from airborne transmission. And here, if we inhale the exhaled air of others without any dilution, we would be here. With a thousand times dilution, we would be here. A million times we would be here. It's a logarithmic scale. Okay? Now, with measurements of distance and dilution for different uh, situations that sociologists categorize according to the distance. So for example, if we're at an intimate distance, maybe the air that someone is exhaling is diluted a hundred times. If we're at a larger distance, it's diluted a thousand times. So we're gonna inhale le less of the virus. Now, you were sharing a room in blue, like for example, a card, which is a very small room that would be risky because if we don't have the ventilation or, or the windows open, we may inhale a lot of that air. If we are outdoors, if we are very close, we can have transmission, but if we are far from others outdoors, the dilution is so large that that's why outdoor transmission, outdoor transmission is negligible in that situation. Okay. So now what happens if we apply the mathematical model that works for super spreading for a person that's very infected for COVID-19? So this is the transmission probability. Or, what fraction of the people would be infected, right? At intimate distance, you have a large chance, large probability of transmission. Um, as you increase the distance, the probability changes strongly. Social distance doesn't eliminate transmission, but it helps. Okay? Then you can have transmission in shared room air, depending on the situation, and basically is negligible outdoors. Now, this is if you spend an hour. What if you spend more time or less time? Well, again, we reproduce the epidemiological observation. If you spend eight hours, you have more chance. If you spend 10 minutes, you have less chance because you are inhaling less of the exhaled air that contains the virus. Okay. Now, this is for someone who is highly infected, but we know most people who have COVID don't infect anyone. And this is one reason is because they don't exhale much virus. And this is now that probably can you see those people have trouble infecting anyone. It's not impossible, but, but they really have to be very close for a long time. Okay. Now you can put tuberculosis and measles here again, and this is tuberculosis in black that will be of interest to you. And we explained that in the paper, but again, it's less transmissible than COVID. So, you know, and, and then a lot of the tuberculosis cases don't transmit to anyone. And this may remind some of you of what Richard Riley remarked on that first paper when he showed tuberculosis is airborne. He showed that only three people had infected the large majority of the guinea pigs. And most of the tuberculosis patients on that world had not infected any guinea pigs. So it's this same super spreading that, um, um, that we see for COVID. Okay? 
Now, uh, Professor Noakes after me will tell you much more about mitigations. I only wanted to advocate for having CO2 detectors everywhere. This is something that is already a law in some countries that can be done for a very low cost. And but that would really inform us of what the amount of exhaled air is in different places, be it hospitals, bars, gyms, schools. And I think we should do that everywhere and it's eminently doable. And it will work for tuberculosis and it will work for COVID. Now, uh, we are undergoing a large paradigm shift. I'm, I'm out of time, but basically we have uncovered a large error. And we realize now that many diseases are airborne and this has big implications and we need to collaborate across disciplines. So I'm especially happy that I was invited to, to speak today for this reason to, to an audience in, in the medical field. Thank you very much.